Alex is one of the hardest working sheet music people in the business, particularly on eBay, and comes across huge collections and tries to figure out how to make parts of them palatable and how to wrangle the other parts, which are just absolutely amazing and get the top dollar for him. Uh, I know that one of his bookshelves has got the Bill Edwards swing because I was buying a lot from him at one point. And really? I was. Not a lot, a lot. So, And uh, last November we lost Johnny Maddox, but even before that, Alex was taking uh, lots of his collection. A lot of the 78s went up into a, a store in Maryland, but many more, and especially all the sheet music went to Alex to disseminate to a lot of happy people around the country. So he's gonna, we're gonna first talk about Johnny a little bit, we're gonna talk about him, and then sugar sheet music, as soon as you sit what, down, it's gonna magically work. You know, that should come up there? Should no, as soon as you sit down, it's gonna magically work, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right, the lady, I'm gonna now sing for you Lazy Bones. <clears throat> no, Frederick, actually. Uh -huh. Now, thou hearest? Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, no, we're, originally, the, the discussion on this particular symposium was the, the fine art of selling Johnny Maddox's sheet music collection. And it, it sort of becomes a little, become a little bit more generalized than the program, but this is very, very specifically uh, the three years that yours truly has spent uh, peddling the, the 75 year accumulation, the, at least the cherry picked. Uh, accumulation of that Maddox, the Maddox is from somewhere like he started collecting in 1939 and he just passed away in November and to the bitter end uh, dear Johnny couldn't couldn't pass by an antique shop uh, without wanting to walk out with something despite the fact that he was probably buying the 50th copy of my sunny Tennessee anyway uh, my little bit of a history with Johnny as follows in 1980 or 81 he was playing a really dazzling five nights a week program on a, uh, on a lacquered hammer upright at the Il Porto Ristorante in Old, Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. You know, those of us, Bill lives some 30 miles from me. You know, we, I played we, down the block, actually. Yeah, we remember, we remember this really very well. This is somebody who could actually make really quite good music on something that really should preclude good music making when you have, you know, it's sort of like the old saloon sound, as you well know from the old Hollywood westerns, is what you get when you lacquer the hammers on an upright piano or any piano. And Johnny, for four or five hours a night, was playing this sort of, uh, in, in the shape of a piano instrument, and he kept his audiences there until all hours, nightly. He had a gig for a couple of decades, and if you can believe it, he told me this. He was pulling in as a solo pianist in the 1970s and 80s at that place, 1,500 bucks a week. And then he got tips. You know, and he probably sold a few LPs and CDs. It, it, it was a stunning tribute to how he managed to maintain, keep his audiences, and did build them up. And um, I met him because this fish out of water they decided to give Sunday nights periodically when he had a night off. So I would play on this, on this thing and somebody would come in and ask for Rhapsody in Blue and I gamely, vainly tried to play Rhapsody in Blue on a honky tonk upright. And, and, you know, I, at which point I was thinking to myself, I think I'd rather be waterboarded. <laughs> anyway, at, uh, so I didn't last long there and I knew perfectly well this was, this was the wrong place for me, but the right place for me was in that audience because he really did a stunning job. And my wife and I used to meet him some, some years later, regularly at flea markets. He would inevitably be in the next bin of sheet music. The guy had a nose for this stuff that uh, probably was unmatched. And once again, he really was an acquirer. This was an accumulation that I ended up eventually cherry picking. He, he lived in an 1805, I don't know, Frederick, would you call it a mansion? Grand house, yeah, the ceilings up to the ray, you know, Himalayan sort of ceilings, and uh, and stuff everywhere. You know, there, there were piles of music on the floor in this room and that room. He had no idea what he had. Here's the attic. Yeah. Well, oh, you found the attic. All right. Now, 
The attic was where he had the vast majority of his accumulation. Remember, I'm calling this an accumulation because when you, in the, the latter, well, probably in much of his vaudeville career, but probably more, more towards the end, uh, he just would probably go into an antique shop, he sees a big pile of music in the middle of the table somewhere, he goes up to the proprietor and he says, now, hey little buddy, and this was Johnny, everybody was little buddy, and uh, <clears throat> little buddy, how much for that whole pile? And then the whole pile, well, probably said five, ten dollars or something, and Johnny handed a bill to them. 90% uh, of which was probably duplicative. So, let's cut to the chase. I, Adam Swanson, who was uh, really very responsible for getting Johnny back into the limelight over the last, I guess, what, decade or so or more. Yeah, you're showing all of this, exactly. You know, I'm not even looking, forgive me, but is it, is it, is it basically matching? Yeah, uh, and by the way, that attic, that house, no air conditioning, and it's Tennessee, and the summer was... Uh, yeah, well, and, and in the attic, I have a bird that is dive-bombing me. There is a wasp infestation in one of the, um, what do you call it, uh, skylights. Uh, there, there, there is this curious white powder at the top of each pile in the various banker's boxes. Now, what is this white powder? You know, I'm thinking to myself, well, what am I getting? It turned out to be, I think, boric acid. He would sprinkle this stuff, and, and I'll tell you, after decades of no climate control in that attic, they, the sheet music was in astonishingly good condition. This is the, uh, we're, we're talking uh, very, I mean, in the infinitesimal amount of insect damage, no water damage, unless it was water damage before he bought it. Well, I'm going to eventually have to cut to why we're here. Uh, his lady friend, and probably his family, his lady friend was a, uh, was a gal named, is a gal named Fredette Eagle. Uh, she lives probably 20 minutes from me and probably a little longer for you. And um, <clears throat> she told him at some point, you know, Johnny, you're going to have to start paying for your, some of your medical expenses. <laughs> and I happened to be visiting at that time because we renewed friendship because Adam had gotten Johnny to come back to the Washington area. I live in Northern Virginia, seven miles west of DC in Falls Church. And so Johnny is in the front row of Adam's performance at the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage. And I didn't, I didn't actually have the opportunity to, to uh, reunite at that point, but a day or so later, I am doing my usual routine of going around checking our, the few antique malls that we have left in the area. I go into one in McLean, Virginia, and who do I see? Johnny is going through a pile of music in this antique mall, so I go in front of him and say, Johnny, Alex here, and it was a renewal. You know, we went and had lunch. I went and visited. Now, this, and this is at the point when his lady friend says, you gotta start paying your bills. It was decided that because we had a very long, at this point, 21 years profile on eBay, I, just a little aside, I had to call customer service at eBay recently. I told them, look, this is not a crank call. Just look at Alex Sarah on eBay, you'll see that I mean business. And this person looked up and said, wow, I've never encountered anybody who's 21 years on eBay. You know, well, but back to Johnny is that I made it clear to them that we had the profile to probably make some money for him to be able to pay some of those mounting bills. And I took things at that point, uh, I didn't take any of them, but that gives you an idea, yeah, he had cil cylinders too. I don't know from cylinders. So, I, so this is entirely a sheet musical and not 78s, nothing yet, entirely musical, sheet musical. And for example, uh, Walt Disney was doing some uh, sort of uh, World War II rah-rah uh, type cartoons in the 1940s, war effort things, and some of them actually got published. Uh, you know, like, uh, one of them was called Donald Duck in, in Nazi Land, and I, you know something, I always forget the name of the stupid song. What's it called again? Their Furious Face. Yeah, Their Furious Face. I should remember just because Spike Jones did it too, right? Um, but that's common. That's sold in the, in the gazillions, but some of these other things weren't even published by Disney. They got, you know, published around the country, very limited amounts, and Johnny had 
minty fresh copies of about three or four of these things. I said, Johnny, you really need these things? Why don't I give these a try? I bring them home, and one of them goes for $1,500. Now, mind you, there's very little sheet music that's out there. And here's why I can generalize a little bit that, that, that can garner that kind of a price. But here we have a man who has an accumulation Starting in 1939, he got into piles of music in 1947 that uh, the, the current nerdish Nebuchadnezzar collectors that we all are, can I speak for every nerdish Nebuchadnezzar collector of sheet music? You know, some, some, may, some may object to that, but you know, you know we're definitely uh, off the charts in, in 2019. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he's getting into piles where we can only dream. And so, here I am, doing the first of probably a half dozen or so cherry picks. Those trips to Gallup and Tennessee were no pleasure from Northern Virginia. It is roughly 600 miles. You can't fly because if you're going to bring back a thousand, two thousand, three thousand pieces for sale, you've got to have a vehicle. So. And it's no fun to, for them to send out, you know. And I don't trust anybody else but myself to do much packing. What was the last vehicle you took? <laughs> well, that's when we purchased. So, when, see, when Johnny Johnny died in November of last year. There was an estate sale, and we decided that uh, we would we would be in the running. My wife and I decided we'd be in the running for the rest of the the the, the non cherry picked stuff. I know I knew what was left in there. And the very, very greatest stuff I'd already picked out for purposes of the, uh, you know, if, if I ever get to see St. Pete, he's going to think, eh, okay, you did okay with Maddox, okay? You know, you, yeah, you're okay. You know. um, so I'd say I'm, you know, all of these asides that I'm getting, I'm getting out yeah. of uh, my, uh, my routine here. I have to stop with the asides. You know, tell, tell me if I'm going off, off target here. But you drove up yeah, a substantial No, car. I didn't drive there. I flew, I flew to uh, Nashville Airport. I, I got an Uber to Gallatin, which is roughly uh, like a 45-minute trip. And then the guy who's running the estate sale has friends in the U-Haul business. And I, I bought the collection, whatever was left in the house, roughly 65,000 pieces. Yeah, it's nuts. It's pure nuts. <clears throat> in a, and I brought it home. First time I've ever driven a 20-foot U-Haul, <laughs> which was very carefully uh, carefully put into that truck by a couple of rather beefy characters in their early 40s, who, the, who got the 175 bankers' boxes of stuff in that house into that truck, very, very carefully center of gravity. Uh, and I had no problems on that trip, other than the fact that I've never driven a 20-foot U-Haul before, and I started driving it like a regular car. <laughs> they have something on there called a governor. Anybody know U-Haul technology? Yes. Okay, so I'm driving it at 70 MPH, and anyway, it feels great. I'm in a lane where I'm not gonna kill anybody but myself, and uh, all of a sudden, it doesn't wanna go up a hill. And it turns out it doesn't wanna go up a hill because I'm driving it too fast, and the engine is, is saying, no, you're not going to be driving like this anymore. I pulled off, I filled up with higher octane gas, and all of a sudden it starts going again. And then I start driving fast again, and it starts doing that again. Anyway, I found out later that it's this thing called the governator. <laughs> yeah, Interstate 81 is not friendly. No, I won't. Well, yeah, I mean, some, it, it was a hill that I thought to myself, oh no, this thing is conking out on me. There were 5,000 5, pounds of music on this, and we're going to have to transfer it to another truck? <laughs> you want to see a grown man cry? Right here. So no, it, it started driving again, and uh, you know, I found out only subsequently uh, how you're supposed to be driving these things. Uh, you know, so park this 20-foot thing in front of my house, and for the next 37 days, mind you, this is stuff we now own. Uh, this, you know, I'll be talking about, with these photos, the stuff that Johnny owned that I cherry picked. This was the stuff that really made some two hundred thousand dollars in a, in the space of three years on eBay. This is this was unheard of in the sheet music market. We we practically redefined 
what could be made with ragtime, black Americana, blues, topical stuff, because he had it all. He had, he had really good examples of them all. There were problematic things too. But anyway, the stuff that we owned was now parked in front of our house, and for the next 37 days, my wife and I were collating. Now fortunately, I have a wife who is really quite equally into this, and Frederick has visited us, Brian has visited us, this character has visited us, Andrew Green, I'm missing somebody here, I'm sure, but, you know, Sarah can be part of the conversation. She is every bit as much of a sheet music nerd as, as the rest of the nerds because she started collecting earlier than any of us. She's 13 years old when she starts collecting, and I managed to find somebody who will not say to me, after I bring home 65,000 sheets, may divorce be with you. <laughs> So anyway, it, uh, I, I kind of looked out. And that garage is full. Well, yes. Now we have a garage, which he probably doesn't want me to advertise, but it's not exactly next door to Sedalia. Two, two more weeks. Give him, give him two more weeks, and he can go through and finish up what he wants. He, he doesn't buy that much. Don't worry. But we have a garage. I 70 from you. You bought 70 pieces? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you about somebody else who came in, but not for what you're looking for. All right. But really, there were, no, there were 40,000 pieces or so. Primarily Johnny stuff, lots of lots of signed sheets. If you're anybody's intrigued with visiting us in Falls Church, Virginia, you buy enough folksies, they're fifty cents a piece. Because it's an unclimate controlled garage and we want to make sure that that stuff gets properly housed somewhere. We we I put eleven hundred new pieces into our already archival collection. Uh, I probably upgraded two thousand or so pieces for our own collection, which was already about 50,000. And what's left in there is not junk. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. I got no, really it's stuff ones. that we just don't collect. My wife and I collect only between the two world wars. We have literally 50,000 pieces just between 1918 and 1942. And I just went through 3,000 of your large formats. I was only starting. No, really, no, it, it, it's an astonishing accumulation. So really, I, we welcome, welcome any visitors. You know, you'll, you'll love the town. Uh, and we have the single greatest 36th tap uh, beer and wine joint that has opened up with a really good menu too. So, you know, there are just great reasons to come to Falls Church. All right, so, but that, so that was all the, so what we have here, all right, so the, the cherry-picked Johnny stuff, which made the really big bucks, was, I, I decided, because we've been doing this for so many years, and I've got a fairly good idea of the market on eBay, that I'm going to be taking the most obvious stuff. It's foolish for me to be cherry-picking anything that, yeah, that's a pretty picture, and then I'm going to have to try to, to, to describe it up the yin-yang to get somebody to look, you know. So, what the, the depictions you're going to be seeing here are a lot of these topical sorts of things. And topical can be political, it could be anything historical, military, it can be world's fairs, you know, it can be famous, famous aviators. It, it's really astonishing what actually gets published uh, just to, uh, to commemorate happenings of their time. In the 19th century, very much so in the 19th century, musically, I don't find terribly much of interest in the 19th century for popular music. I know that there are a lot of people out there who would, who would be ready to, uh, you know, to waterboard me for that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much of this sort of late romantic era with a beat, uh, 1920s and 30s. This, uh, this, is, this is the way I, I exist. Well, I see the interest. One of the great collectors of 19th century doesn't collect it for the music. He collects it for the the really historical nature, the topicality of it, and he doesn't—he doesn't want me to advertise them. But you know, I'll—you know—anybody who wants to talk with me afterwards, uh, you know, he'll probably kill me if he finds out that I did even that. So, anyway, so I started—we started the the first of those cherry picks three plus years ago, and Johnny was very sorry to see his beloved children go because that's really how he treated this collection. Um, but it was impressed upon him that, you know, insurance wasn't covering everything. And my gosh, we were sending checks every, every couple of weeks. Uh, 
one of the great pieces, which I, you probably, well, you have it later. You'll be the single greatest, right? Yeah. All right, but so you're going to be, so, so Bill, Bill, who is, is, is the local wizard of <laughs> stuff, where we decided, what, what I was able to get from various bidders over the last three years, because I've also maintained relationships, correspondences with most of them, and it's really quite jovial. You know, and they, they, they bookmarked us. They couldn't wait until the next, the next batches that Every came Sunday. up. Yeah, it, it's a, it, it, you know, the, the major collectors had never seen this stuff because he started collecting it so long ago. He got into these batches. They, you know, everybody thinks that they know, they've seen everything. No, not when, when, the, when the Maddox stuff came along, it was, it was proven quite different. And I even told Johnny that, you know something, if you would come to the Library of Congress, I could show you a category that would prove that you, yourself, only scratched the surface of what was out there on a lot of this stuff. You know, it's, it's just way too, way too long after the fact. So, those Disney things did brilliantly, a few other things, and then it was decided this was going to become a full-fledged business slash friendship here. And uh, so, various scheduled trips, just with car, you know, I never took much more than, you know, probably two or three thousand pieces at a time, which lasted a fairly good time. <laughs> And sing, single sheets, uh, you know, now we're in the, in the very tail end of things and it's, it's very difficult to find anything that hasn't already been tried. And I'm, I'm sending the money uh, to, to pay some of the uh, expenses of the, of the sons, four sons he had, at the, who, you know, certain expenses came up after, after their father's death. So, anyway, so what are you showing here? Bunker the, the Hill. Bunker Hill Quick Step. Bunker Hill, as I recall, is a monument in Boston. I've been to the top of that. Okay. I'm, I'm right it's up It's like uh, yeah. two-thirds of the size of the Washington Yeah, line. so I, you know, I had to look these things up. I'm finding myself, wow, I'd never know this. Unless I had we gotten into this this deal with Johnny and the family. I mean, I'm finding out stuff about the history of this country that, you know, you you won't just find out serendipitously. This this is one of those where, my gosh, I've got this piece of, piece of uh, yellowing paper in front of me, and I'm, I have to Google it. And I said, yeah, by and large, a lot of this was holy mackerel. Now, oh, the Minutemen thing. Now, this is really intriguing. This is this is Civil War period, and this this is uh, I think what is it uh, New Orleans or something or what? Yes. Right. Right. Okay. What what's the story with Minutemen in the Civil War period in New Orleans? It turns out, when Lincoln is inaugurated, they get all worried down there that they're going to lose everything and they set up their own Minutemen to, to prevent the marauding Union hordes from coming down there. Um, so that's the March of the Minutemen and, you know, yeah, I've heard of Minutemen, but I can't, I, I want to list them properly. So you really, you've got to put in a few of these sort of catchwords that are likely to get the interest of somebody who's, who collects more than just sheet music. You know, I set Louisiana as the keystone in that arch there. Yeah. Well, and, well, you know, and there are people out there who collect New Orleans public sheet music. It doesn't matter pretty much what. Similarly, there are people who collect Nashville. We found that out that they were spending anything to get really rather boring looking pieces. Uh, but, you know, and not all, you know, Civil War, you think, my gosh, that, that's got to be rare. But even there, there are just certain pieces that show up all the time. I don't consider myself an expert on that period by any point, in any in any in any uh, real sense. But I'm starting to get an idea of what not to pick up, and yeah, it, it's only experience, folks. So you know, anybody who thinks that they can immediately start start uh, peddling this kind of of uh, this kind of music or any kind of music on eBay, all you have to do is look on a daily basis on eBay with a little of experience and see how little really interesting stuff is put up in any given day. It, it's, it's a veritable luck out to find anything anymore. People are putting up the, the, the 915th copy of Ramona, uh, or the, the 2000th uh, of, of, you know, you name the hit parade and everybody thinks because Big Crosby is on the cover, it's rare. Sorry, it sold a million copies in 1934. It's not ever going to be valuable. Oh, but then there's Joan of Arc calling. Right. The Joan of Arc piece? Well, there are several. Yes, well, 
there's right. one that are we going to get to it? Is there a, no, it's not on well, here. There's, oh, there's a common one. Well, yeah, there's a common one. Yeah, there. yeah and it, exactly. And there, you know, there are Joan of Arc. There are silent films. There are probably shows. There are just commemorations with some sort of a drawing of, you know, an ancient scene. So this is out of order, actually. So I want to find. Well, there we go. You want to catch what? You came back to. Yeah, I'm going to go back to that. All right. Well, Johnny had a fair fair amount of Tennessee published uh, Confederate sheet music, and this is the kind of stuff that, if it ever shows up, uh, it spurs a lot more than just sheet musical collectors. So these things. Here's your mule. Two different colors. The major collector that I that I'm talking about, who I consulted with on this, told me, Alex, if you have both of these pieces, look on the last page of one of them. There is a glued-in piece of paper with an extra lyric. That means that it was published in, in the time when Tennessee was Confederate, which it wasn't always. You look at the other one, nothing is glued in. How on earth can somebody who just comes upon a piece like that in a file somewhere know anything like that? There he's <laughs> holding it, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, he, yeah, but... I don't know which one he's holding, you know, and that just, I think he's holding the one on the... Yeah, but which one, I don't remember which one of them has that glue there, that's my point. Did Johnny know that? I don't know. You know, he was probably, he probably thought it was very neat to have Confederate sheet music, you know, yeah, a lot of it is really quite valuable, but you know, you've got to make sure you put all the catchwords in, and you've got to make sure and put a lot of these things in categories other than sheet music as well as sheet music. So there may be a category that's, you know, Civil War, you know, paper memorabilia, Civil War, something paper of the time, Civil War reprints, you know, you, you, you basically have to browse. And this gives you a very, very good idea that, you know, maybe there's more to this than is going to be just, just these uh, Rorschach dots on a piece of paper. So I, uh, I, learned, I learned a hell of a lot about this, just, just the sheer magnitude of the project. You, you can't help but really with the total immersion therapy that I had with this. We were selling at one point two auctions a week, Wednesdays and, and Sunday nights, two different auctions of the kinds of stuff that I cherry picked. It, it, was, it, it got kind of numbing. Because, you know, I, I, I even had to tell them at one point, uh, Johnny, for that, you know, last thing I looked, I wasn't actually listed on your family registry. It, this is, it's wearing me out, you know, that sort of thing. But it, 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 it was fascinating. This and, is the sequel, by the way. All right, and the, well, it's actual sequel, you did your homework on that too? It says sequel to here's your oh, sequel. sequel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but how would one know, unless you're a student of the history of the period, that this is some famous uh, rally song of some sort during the Confederacy. News to me, folks, but there's the selling point. Uh, you know, and there's a certain element of you have to, you, you know, if you have any kinds of, of worries about selling certain kinds of sheet music, uh, by and large, as a seller, you have to be, you have to be somewhat coy and cagey about it and just, you know, you, you can't be ballyhooing the fact that you, for example, are selling black Americana. Uh, now, black Americana sounds all very, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure how much you, do you, do you have the policy kings folio in here? Uh, no, not here. No. no, okay. Well, anyway, a lot of, you know, I don't have to tell anybody into the history of the period that, that the so-called black Americana, roughly 1895 through about 1910, can be pretty grotesque. And, but, this is part of Johnny's archives, and I, I have to be cagey about it. I have to, I have to put that up too, and it, it's, you know, you have to put in words like grotesque, crude, these sort of things, and there are just a lot of collectors out there who are, they're going to click, and in 2016, that stuff, rare ragtime, a lot of the, 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 rather the most valuable of his topical things, pulled in an enormous amount of money. We, we were taking very little as a commission. You could take a commission of 20% and still, and still do very well if, if the piece is pulling in four figures. And four figures happened a good half dozen times with Johnny's collection. And I think, frankly, there were, there were several 
bank accounts around the country that were ruined, were ruined by uh, Alex Serra on eBay. Uh, they couldn't help it. One of the major collectors of a lot of these things uh, had to sell off part of her collection to continue collecting. I'd like to point out with this, it's interesting, it's uh, Stonewall Jackson's Prayer. All of the locations that show it published were in the North. Well, he, here's another thing. The North was publishing a lot of the of that most grotesque stuff that I just yep. I just described. So you know, all of these, all of the ideas that we have about North versus South, there weren't that many publishers in the South either. You you compare that to Tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley wanted to get in on get in on the money. That's basically it. And progressivism be damned is what it was. Money, money, money ruled then, money rules a long time later. Yeah, but I have no opinions on the subject. All right, uh, but what are you showing? Oh yeah, Velocipede Gallup, all right. Transportation, so early aviation, early bicycling. There, there are bicycling clubs who collect historical bicycle materials. You know, who would, who would have thunk? But when we first, when, you know, when we first put up some of Johnny's you know, these sorts of velocity things, and, and just, I mean, there's some sort of a bicycling, there were bicycling clubs even in the 19th century. Well, sure enough, they still exist, and some of them are into it for the history, and they're pulling in three, four, five hundred dollars. But try finding them outside of a collection where a guy's been accumulating this long. You know, we're, we're not talking the newest paper. Now, mind you, 19th century paper is a lot better than the first probably 30 or 40 years in this, you know, of, of the sheet music uh, publishing uh, that they followed. They had that sort of, what is it, rag? What, what? McKinley music stuff. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, look, Jerome, Jerome Remick is a publisher in the 19-teens, in the 19-teens, but in the 20s, the paper stock that they're using is, ver is veritably disintegrating now for the innards of, of the sheets. Whereas you can get an 1840s, 1830s piece, it's fine. There's, there, there may be no chipping, there may be no... Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember the date on that, but, you know, I mean, we're, we're not talking anything new here. The, the artwork is not always color litho. I mean, a lot of it's kind of boring black and white. But it's, it's once again, the topicality, because there were way too many songs of, uh, I, I met her neath the maple tree. You know, there, there's a very famous, Neat the Maple from the 1880s by Gussie Davis, what's yes. that called again? I don't remember specifically. It, 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 it's, a, it's a piece of music that was continually reissued and nobody can ever find the original. There has to be an original. Gussie Davis was a black songwriter of the 18, what, 70s, 80s, 90s. The first real big seller, as the I fatal recall. Fatal Wedding. <clears throat> he wrote The Fatal Wedding. Yeah, Fatal Wedding and uh, the Creole something, another famous one. Yeah, so Johnny, it turns out, had a ton of Gussie Davis pieces. You know, this is great. You can really advertise it. Early black songwriter. And some, some others, you know, Mabel McKinley, for example. I think the niece of the president. Vivian Gray. That was her nom de plume. Well, no, she shows up as Mabel McKinley. Yeah, eventually, yeah, yes. we're, we're talking, Mabel McKinley might be in an inset photo and she's a warbler, you know? But she's, bank, she's banking on a rather famed relation who happens to be occupying the Oval Office. Uncle President. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very interesting. All right, so what do you have? Confederate reunion. It's not published, obviously, this, during the Confederacy. This is Mary Lee Guy. This is what? It's a, it's a woman composer. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. And, and yeah. I think there were two copies. I mean, that's another thing. There are just so many copies of these. He, Johnny kept finding more, but it's when he found many copies of something that's legitimately valuable that we were really hitting pay dirt. Uh, because then, what you do is, is you go to your second bidder and you offer them, you know, set, you know what is it, buy, second chance buyer or something like that, second chance bidder. And very often, oh my, we have, a, we have a chance to get another copy of this. You know, some people only want the, uh, the copy that they were bidding on originally. They think maybe you're, you're pulling something on them by offering them a second, but I think the ones who really know how rare and valuable these things are, they jump at the chance. So that, that's another thing here. Confederate reunion, <clears throat> now buzzing the bee, I don't recall that being terribly valuable, but the person who is pictured 
It is collected. May Irwin. May Irwin is the woman in that very famous film clip in the 1890s, I think. The Kiss. The Kiss. This, this, this ancient film, you know, a few, what is it? We're not even talking the real, right? We're just talking a few feet of film. And she's the one who's engaging in the kiss with whoever. And she is one of, is one of these female singers in the, you know, sort of minstrelsy of the period. And what a big name of her time. One, one, one photo after another, one show after another. But that, you know, come 19, probably come 1900 through 1905, that's pretty much the end of her era. You know, with all of these, uh, I mean, what would you call those singers? Uh, what would you not want to call those singers? Well, she was sort of one of the earlier coon shouters before Blossom well, Seely took Well, that's over. it. You know, I, I sort of, uh, I, I just sort of hesitate even using the, the terminology of the period, because it's just such different times here. But, but yeah, that, that, this, this is what that, we're talking, uh, I don't know, well, you know something, I decided not to do that part of the of the display here. You know, a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's got it's got a lot of value to it. You really should pick it up if you see it. But you know, I don't want to ballyhoo it. We we did it. It's not the kind of it's not the kind of music that we would collect. Um, and however however I'm coming across it, uh, that it's it's a little bit cringeworthy. More than a little bit cringeworthy at times. So anyway, what do we have here? Just like you know, that Berlin. is all right. Irving Berlin. Now, there are the Irving Berlins that show up with a tremendous regularity. And there's the, you know, the Alexander Wagner Band and in Simple Melody. The, international and, Rag. Yeah, International Rag, uh, Mesmerizing Mendelssohn, too. There, there, there are just a ton of them that, that will, they're the ones that sold. The ones that didn't sell aren't always valuable because the major collectors have them, too. It's the ones that the few majors who are left are vying for that, uh, that that's where you will get yourself some uh, some fairly good bucks. There is a price guide for these things, but the price, you know, I, I have a problem with price guides and cheap music because it may it may be a snapshot bidding war that'll never happen again. What but I find uh, interesting here is yeah. that it was published by Harry Von Tilzer. Well, not yeah, and things published by you know not by good old Irving, but by Ted Snyder or by. Harry Von Tilzer, yes. I mean, why would Harry Von Tilzer, who was publishing his own pieces, publish one by Berlin? You know, they had, obviously everybody knew each other. Um, but Berlin, it's not easy to find. Obviously, in the year 2019, the ones that didn't sell in, in earlier than 1919. But here we go again. Johnny had a very good contingent of them in that 75-year accumulation. It's, it was like going into a sheet music archives in 1920-something. You know, they haven't, they haven't thrown anything out yet. They, you, know, but you, you add a couple of decades, and the publishers, they had a, a inventory tax where the publishers were, were going to have to spend uh, boku bucks just keeping an unsold inventory. So they ended up trashing a lot of really astonishingly rare, wonderful music because otherwise they were going to have to pay for it. Unsold stock, basically. So it became tremendously rarer all of a sudden. It's the 40s or 50s when this thing happened. It happened with record companies too, I'm sure. You know, this was something called the inventory tax. And you know, you want to talk about stupid taxes, they, they really had to find a reason for this one. You know, they're, they're forcing up, it's the publisher's problem to store these things. But somebody, some bright light had to figure out that, that we have to tax something that that they're not selling. So chant of the weed. No, so we got chant of the weed. Don Redman was a black band leader, songwriter, and this is a piano solo. You know, one of these sort of moody things like Big Spider Bex uh, in a Mist. And um, oddly enough, I wonder if any of you in here know what orchestra recorded chant of the weed on a 12-inch 78 in the mid 1930s. I don't. It doesn't matter who, who answers. You know. I mean, I sort of expect it from. Looking at Brian. No. 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 It, it, it's an orchestra that's going to absolutely boggle your mind. Larry Clinton. I no. Larry Clinton. Castellanos. 
deck. Andre Castellanos had an actually really quite bouncy full orchestra in the 1930s, probably into the early 40s, and then it became elevator music. Because, you know, you could tell by the mid-1930s that he's, he's using a chorus in a, there, there's a recorded uh, 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 Dietz and Schwartz show called Revenge with Music, where Castellanos is, is, he's already put in a chorus, he's putting in a lot of violins, and you know what's coming. But in the 1930s, it still sounds great. All right. Rastus. Rastus. You know, I don't even remember selling it, but obviously we sold it. Yeah, the, this is a, a piano solo in a really famous series of piano solos for us people who, you know, like Frederick and I and Brian and Andrew. We, well, I would say, sitting right next to me, Jack Mills publisher. The Jack Mills novelty piano solos of the 1920s, primarily early to mid 1920s, they were still doing some stuff after that. Um, they were reasonably well scored, some of them very well scored, and this was the, you know, Zez Confrey, um, you know, of course now, now I have to think of everybody but Godfrey, uh, and I, you know, you know, it's sort of like Monty Python, me brain hurts, but, I want them but to. at their rarest, they, they, even to this day, they, they command some attention from pianists primarily interested in this so the post-ragtime, pre-swing, uh, novelty piano, or rhythmic piano, or syncopated piano style. And uh, they're fun to find, but even with these pieces, certain ones sold. Now, Lawrence Wright, in England, I'm looking at my buddy Neville over here. In England, uh, Lawrence Wright was the licensor for Jack Mills, so you find a lot of these things over the pond as well. But the rarest of the rare, you know, neither side of the pond are going to show up with any regularity. Do you hear me when I get off of the mic? Yes. Do you hear me when I get off of the mic? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so the next one I think is the big one, and if anybody wants to guess, it has something to do with Sedalia, it has something to do with this festival, but it's not quite that one, it's the other version of it. Anybody? Uh -huh. Okay, all right, well, here is a world-famous piece of sheet music. There are very, very few copies extant, and Johnny had one. And this is the vocal version of the Maple Leaf Rag. And you can see, this is one of those black stereotype covers. Uh, once again, they were a lot worse than this one, folks. But here we have one, and so it, it was in very good condition. And there was a bidding war. This is when people still had bank accounts before we got deeply into selling off of Johnny's collection. This thing went for $3,240, which is indicative of how, how uh, frequently it shows up anywhere. And uh, it went to somebody who, for whom that's really not a terrible sum of money. Somebody who, in, you know, in our collecting business is a lawyer in money. So that's all, you know, it's all good to say. <clears throat> um, so, it, you know, it, it was stunning, you know, until Johnny's collection came along, our all-time record high price for anything was a 78 RPM performance of a, of a harmonica player singing one of his own blues. J. Bird Coleman singing whatever his harmonica blues, which was $846, and you know, when that happened probably 20 years ago, uh, I sort of inched up to to the top of the house, and I uh, looked into our bedroom. Uh, Sarah, did you see what we just made on harmonica, whatever it is? And you know, it, for a long time, it was a, it was a big whoop for us. But then, then came along Maddox sheet music from from uh, Walt Disney rarities to the rarest of the rare from the time period which we're showing you. All right, so Paragon, Paragon actually used to do better. This one, uh, I think it did perfectly well. A lot of them made, you know, in the three, four hundred dollar range. I mean, Paragon Rag is something that, long before Johnny, uh, I found in the flea market for 90 cents. And at that time, Sandy Ewing, major, major, major collector of sheet music uh, down in uh, Baton Rouge, we had a private sale. And 90 cents turned into something like $750. You know, that... Uh, if that could happen every week, you know, we wouldn't mind paying the, you know, at the local 
wine and beer joint uh, eating out every night, you know? Well, it's interesting. This was uh, originally free. That one. It says Which complimentary one? coffee. This right? Sometime is complimentary? Can you imagine they gave away this rag? Somebody <laughs> gave this away. Yeah, I see, once again, I don't quite remember what Stomp Time did. Stomp, stomp Time, that's great. We have same to write guy. a new rag, Stomp Time. It's yeah. the same guy. Though. Same guy, okay. Oh, all right, all right. Well, you know, and the, and the same, the, the, the James Scott and Joseph Lamb rags were regularly pulling four figures. It, it says, but remember, it takes two to tangle. How about this one? School of Rag Time didn't do as well as you thought. No, no. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe I put them up too early before uh, they, people got excited. Uh, but no, you're not going to find it. it. It's still exceptionally rare, but it doesn't have the it doesn't have the cover art pizzazz. Like this. Of, of yeah. Like, the way I should look here. Yeah. Well, sure. That was pretty bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Exactly. You know, look, it's got every stereotype in the book, and that's what. You know, that's what the cagey seller has to say in the, in the advertisement for it. So, a great Scott, yeah. Anything like that at, at the time, when these things were, it was very unusual for these things to be turning up on eBay, especially in the quantity. Every week, I had enough stock to work with that, you know, these people, they just couldn't believe, the, the few collectors out there who had the wherewithal, they couldn't believe their good luck until they no longer had money, in which case, uh, I guess the, uh, the, should I say the joke was on uh, somebody else at that point, but yeah. Sunburst, um, oddly not as rare as others, as, as it turned out. I think Johnny probably had three, four, five of them. He couldn't resist. He, this was the sheet music rescue service. His attic, sure, I told him, in, uh, I think about a month or two before he passed, I visited him in his rehab facility in Gallatin, and I told him, Johnny, you know, really, it, the few feet before you climb into your attic, you should, you should have put a sign, Maddox Sheet Music Rescue Service. And really, uh, there, at, at the time, there were probably a good <clears throat> 200 banker's boxes filled to the brim. And it, it, it was just awful being up there. But where else are you going to find this sort of thing? Well, I don't think, uh, I, I, don't think I got any dread diseases, so it, it worked. The, the boric acid worked, right? So there's honey moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah the, well, frankly, anything John Stark, whether it's called Stark music or John Stark music, that uh, you put that in the title of your listing, and that's immediately getting in it, uh, getting people to look. Yeah, astonishing. I it wouldn't have occurred to me really before thoroughly immersing in this stuff. Um, <clears throat> now we, we we're on rag time right now. now you, put yeah. in, you put yeah, you, you put in more of the rags, knowing full well that these came from yeah from the Maddox, yeah. Uh, stunning rarity, especially the Stark things from the latter part of the John Stark publishing when they became smaller format and very poor quality paper, and they, you know, they weren't meant to last. That would be this 1919. Yeah? yeah. Pegasus. Yeah, Pegasus was not small. I can't remember. I think yeah. it may have, it was either one of the last large yeah. format or one yeah. of the Yeah, folks, we probably peddled a good 10,000 or more of his pieces over three years. You know, every one of those, every one of those uh, cherry picking trips down there, uh, it, it, it resulted in a only months really of listings because we were listing so frequently. And that probably also was the reason we did in a lot of those people. There were, there were, some, there were some monikers on eBay we just never saw again after 2016. Could be that their, uh, their accountants told them, that's it, no more. Well, this is a fascinating combination because it's Harry Blaine Belcher, whose husband, of course, helped uh, was one of the heads of Rimmick Music, okay. and here she is writing with Irving Berlin. For well, see, Snyder. see, that's where he knows more than I. I saw, I saw the rather obscure Irving Berlin on it, and that's that. I mean, there are going to be more Berlin collectors than Henriette Blaine Belcher, I suspect. But disabuse me of this if I uh, if I if I'm just being opinionated and not and not factful. Um, Find one out, Julian L. Tenge. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Now, here's a category that would never have occurred to me. The vaudevillian cross-dressers. The uh, either called male or female impersonators or cross-dressers. Uh, you know, and, and I don't, there's no other name for that at the period. Either, those are the, those are the uh, adjectives or whatever they're called. 
TVs now. Uh, and they were the most famous one of the large format pre-World War I era was a fellow named Julian Elting. And honestly, he actually was kind of pretty. This guy actually dolled himself up, and you know, you actually would look twice. And that's not necessarily the case of, of a fellow in the 1920s, uh, who was, is equally collectible, named Carol Norman, who was kind of a, a nothing-looking guy, and that doesn't usually bode well if you're making yourself up to be of the distaff gender. So, uh, but there are more than just Elting, and you probably have a picture of of uh, Carol Norman too, or somebody. I don't, th I don't think well, so. Well, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll stick to the earlier period. You had the male, the male crossdressers, the the male impersonators, and they're starting to gain some interest too. It's really more the other side of the coin, and there were there were a pair of sisters, uh, who are not here, but which one? Is He's so good. Again? Yeah. Is this somebody on the, in the photo here? Uh, no, no. That's okay. just the drawing, yeah. a Pfeiffer drawing. Yeah. Well, just just one more one more little uh, thing about these uh, the cross dresses that there there was a pair of sisters, Marion Sunshine and Florence Tempest. Uh, I suspect that they both had the same name at one point one point or another in their lives, and they had this really kind of weird act when the sisters were dressing up on stage as male and female. It just you know you think about the the possibilities there, and it's sort of why the Astaire's stopped dancing together after a certain point, too. Uh, there, there, there might have been a little bit of a cringe factor at, after a certain point. Now, what are you showing now? Rare Berlins. Yeah, and these are legitimately scare-serving Berlins, and once again, the price guide that may still be in print is not really useful for an actual price that's going to, that you're going to get. It, it was indicative of what it once got, but it is a very good way of creating a minimum bid. So if something has gotten $150 before, you don't want to put $10 as your minimum. You might put $25. What are you, what are you content with as a, minute, as a minimum on this piece? It should depend on how much you paid for it, right? And uh, what condition? Here's, now here's a problem with a lot of Johnny's sheet music. And I've never seen anything like it. There, Johnny had visitors probably 10, 15 years ago, maybe more, from Scandinavia, for, for whatever reason. And they introduced Johnny to the fine art of archival taping. Now the problem with archival taping is if you have the wrong tape, uh, yes, it's not going to yellow, but it's going to ruin the yellowing paper. He put bright white archival tape on yellowing browning paper. And really, I'm sure it ruined the value for a lot of potential bidders. If, if he had been introduced to the proper archival tape, which is like rice paper, yeah, that stuff is not going to, that's pretty much not going to yellow in your lifetime. Don't worry about it. It's kind of expensive, but it's worth it. I have actually made really ratty sheet music sellable again with the judicious use of this rice, rice papery stuff. I usually have to get a little drunk first because you have to have really steady hands. You know, I can't come on and start doing this to the, uh, and, and hope to get a straight piece of tape onto the paper. I'll probably end up taking the upper layer of paper off when I you know, mistakenly put it on the wrong, uh, the wrong tear. You know, the tear that's already been repaired, right? So how do we rectify this, 1917? The Alexander's got a jazz band now? Yeah. Yeah, well, once again, the, you know, I wasn't going to give a whole lecture on this, but these, these images were sent to me by the various uh, bidders over the last three years of some of the very best stuff that they had purchased from us. They were really very gracious about providing these scans. And whatever one may think of the cover, it was a stitch in time, and it's, it's never going to be very common anywhere a hundred years later. All right, here we have a fairly scarce, very early George Gershwin. Early George Gershwin, unless it's Swanee, will, will be worth taking a second glance at it at Pilot the Flea Market, or at Pilot the Antique Mall. Uh, the very first published, you know, here, here's something what you just brought up, brought up about, about Berlin. The first published Gershwin song is Harry Von Tilsner as well. 
Once again, they all knew each other. Uh, Michael Feinstein is in my grapevine, and he was willing to trade a duplicate of that first published Gershwin song, which, you know, I probably wouldn't want to mortgage myself to win on an auction. Now, I can't remember what we, what we traded for it, but it, everybody was happy. Uh, name of which, Frederick? Marie of Sunny Italy. Want him, you can't get him. When you got him, you don't want him. You don't want him. It, it, it's, it's called misogyny in the year 1916. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, but Gershwin here, oh, well, that was Gershwin. So, uh, an example of something that is worth taking a second glance, especially if you've never heard of it. If you heard of the song, 90% of the time, you've heard of it because it's sold, and it's never going to have any value. You know, sometimes you might have something that's a first edition, and then somebody records it, and all of a sudden, they get out to the cover of the new edition. Yeah, you have to know your stuff then, but the earlier edition wasn't going to make it. And then all of a sudden somebody like, you know, it might have been a Kate Smith, and they decide to record something, and all of a sudden it's a hit, and they no longer use that cover anymore. That really becomes quite scarce. Jolson did that quite often. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you put Jolson on it, you put Bing Crosby on it, you know, that it's, it's gonna sell in a given era. The Texas Tommy Swing. We're doing shows now. Yeah, right, okay, shows. Um, most shows, of the early era are more operettas. This is not really the Tin Pan Alley yet. Tin Pan Alley starts really more in the late teens, mid to late teens. We have two minutes. So huh? We have two minutes left. We have two minutes left. I knew this would fly by. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have spoken that Allegro Vivace instead of just Allegro. Um, Ziegfeld Follies. The sheet music published in Ziegfeld Follies has a lot of pizzazz. And once again, if you haven't heard of the song, and there are songs even from that period that made it. If you haven't heard of it, uh, well worth picking up. Watch Your Step is, 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 can be very common. Several of the sheets from an Irving Berlin show. Uh, stunning covers. Uh, that, well, yeah, she's getting, well, I think, you know, you can just give an idea. That's all At its best, the, the, the Broadway of the teens primarily is really quite stunning. And then by 19, 1918 or so, it's no longer the large format. It becomes what we all know uh, is, is more apt to be found. Standard format. Yeah. Early Jerome Kern, there's, there's some very common stuff, but he's involved with these Hikiku shows, as was called Porter. Uh, some of them are stunningly rare. This guy is a boxer, so that's another sport. You get, you get pictures or depictions of, of uh, Jack Johnson, or, 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 okay, another, here we have another Irving Berlin show, uh, World War I connection. Next. All right, this is Rogers and Hart, way before their big names. And they are pseudonymous. Uh, they weren't, I don't think they were necessarily, they weren't publishing for Edward B. Mark's music at the time. There are two, two songs that get published with this pseudonymous uh, they a moniker of, of whatever they use. They're like three or four names. Uh, one of them, which you showed, is called Moonlight Mama. The other one uh, will, will be $1,500 on auction, and we've never found an original. Uh, okay. Quite more. More, more, uh, fairly, fairly rare as it turned out, and yeah. valuable. Scouts, uh, Kit Kat. Duke Ellington. No, no, a lot of Duke Ellington is very common, but you get to some of these other things published by somewhat lesser Tin Pan Alley publishers, and you've got yourself something good. Uh, Fats Waller's London Suite is only published in England, so yeah, you need to pick it up on your next trip over there because you're not going to find it here unless you find it in my collection, maybe in this collection. Some other collections of one of those rows. Uh, the well, last one is the rare Disney you were talking about. From oh, Big good, to Air Power. good. Excellent. Here, Johnny had three or four copies of this, probably from publisher's stock somewhere. But he found it, I guarantee you, he found it in the 1940s or 50s when nobody cared. And that's why it was still there, either in the music store bins or God knows where he found it. And it was put up. And Wow, we this twice as much as we'd ever gotten for any piece of music. We, you know, it's, my wife and I are looking at each other thinking, why couldn't we own this one, right? Um, and and then we offered the second copy to the second bidder, and he was being real cagey about it. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that. So I discussed with Johnny, look, what are you happy with with getting for your second copy? Are you happy with $800? Uh, 
you know, half of what this other guy was originally willing to bid, because he's the one who bid it up to 1500 Why is he then unwilling? Because he probably doesn't like the idea of, of a, second, a second copy being bandied about that quickly after the first one sells. It's like he probably thought it was a scam. No, we're dealing with a collection that had two copies. E equally brilliant condition, both copies. It's, it is pure serendipity when that happens. And so Johnny was perfectly happy with, with that half price, and, and that, it was good for everybody concerned. Anyway, we're done.